Hello, Mike. Thank you. And thank you, everyone who's listening on this auspicious occasion. This is study number 66 and is the final study, I think. Back in 2012, I self-published a book on Amazon, which is still available as a printed version or a Kindle purchase, called The Better Covenant. If you buy the printed copy, you get the Kindle version free. And then, almost 10 years later, January the 7th, 2021, working with Mike Coles, we began to a series called The Better Covenant Revisited. So we were going to look at the book. I would read the chapters. I would think about them. I would see if there were things I wanted to add or develop. And we would do a series. I thought the series might be about, well, there were 25 chapters. So I thought there might be, uh, or chapter 26 chapters. So I thought there might be something like that. Well, we're up to 66. So thank you. If you've followed us this long, you are patient, persistent, and uh, thank you very much for your for all those things. Okay, so we started on January the 7th, 2021, and most weeks there was a study bringing it up to August the 4th, 2022, with chapter 26 of the book, The Better Covenant, and study 66, entitled Where do I go from here? It depends, of course, on where you are when you ask the question. I was once given this question as a topic to address a group of teenagers who had all made decisions at a Billy Graham meeting. I conducted an experiment in which they followed a series of instructions that I issued step by step. Stand up, turn right, take three steps, turn left take two steps, etc. As you can imagine, it was pretty chaotic. But one person in the group actually arrived at the exit. Now, that was no accident. He was the one I had in mind as I issued the instructions. It was all to illustrate the point that there is no single answer to the question, where do I go from here? There are as many answers as there are people asking the question. And, of course, there's another statement, another question that needs to go along with it was, where am I? So we should not expect a detailed prescription in this study, but hopefully some practical pointers to anyone who wants to make progress in their Christian pilgrimage. It is absolutely necessary. Heavy burdens that new converts carry are often in terms of the labels that we give to them. What do I mean by that? Well, in some circles, an inquirer or even a complete stranger will be asked, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? If the answer is yes, a brief prayer will be followed by the assertion, your sins are now forgiven. You're now born again, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you're guaranteed a place in heaven. I recall hearing a church leader telling a true story. He was working in a city in the north of England, and they were passing out evangelistic tracts in a red light district. That's an area where there's a a lot of prostitution. One of the working girls was offered a tract and turned it down. I don't need one of those, she said. I'm born again. The perplexed missioner asked what she meant. She replied, that she'd gone forward at an evangelistic rally, and having been counsel, had prayed the sinner's prayer. She pulled from her handbag a leaflet. It was a prayer letter from the organization that had held the evangelistic rally. It gave an account of the meeting that included an item entitled something like Streetwalker Finds Christ. The news item recounted the event and rejoiced that the streetwalker had prayed the sinner's prayer and had been converted. She was sent on her way rejoicing that she had been born again, and her name was now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The prayer letter had become her assurance that all was now well between her and God, and that a welcome awaited her in heaven. Now, this is certainly an extreme case, 
But how did evangelicals ever get to the place where this sad parody of evangelism was acceptable? I want to talk about misused labels. I think one of amongst evangelicals that one of the most misused labels is the phrase born again. The phrase is taken from the Bible, from John chapter 3, where Jesus is in conversation with a a leading rabbi, and he says, I'm quoting from the King James Version, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The sentence, you must be born again, I think has probably been titled for thousands of sermons. We must, however, understand it rightly to avoid putting an unbearable burden on the shoulders of those who hear it. You see, this is not a divine command. It's not a command as it's so often preached. It's the statement of a spiritual fact of life. I've used the old King James Version to make the point. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. If we take a careful note, of the sentence, we notice that Christ switched from the personal pronoun in the singular the, when he's speaking to Nicodemus, to the personal pronoun plural in the word ye, when he is clearly including all those who are there. This is the equivalent of saying, don't be amazed at what I say to you personally, Nicodemus, that everyone must be born again. Christ is addressing Nicodemus, that's the the pronoun, but the information he gives is not an instruction to Nicodemus, but an explanation. If this were an instruction or a command, it would be in the Greek imperative, but it isn't. Christ is simply expressing the spiritual truth to Nicodemus that it is necessary. Dei, D-E-I is the Greek word, That's where it says that it was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria. It is necessary that everyone be born again, or as we could translate it, from above. You see, this is a spiritual axiom. So the spiritual truth is expressed simply and follows very naturally from what preceded it. In John chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Nicodemus, ye, all of you, must be born again. Christ is simply making the point that it is necessary that everyone is born again from above. It's a spiritual axiom, a statement that is self-evidently true everywhere. It's the starting point of an explanation, not an introduction to be obeyed. Why am I stressing this? Well, I have actually heard the statement directed at a struggling believer, you need to get yourself born again. I think that's a sad um, and unkind comment if we understand really what this statement is really saying. We can make as little contribution to our second birth as we did to our first. The matter is out of our hands. This is why, in this famous passage, Christ declares it to be the unique work of the Spirit, and his ways are untraceable, untrackable. John chapter 3, verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And the words wind and spirit are translations of the same Greek word in the original text. You see, regeneration is 100% a work of God. This utter dependence upon someone else strikes hard at the root of our independence, and there's an almost irrepressible determination in human beings to make some contribution to being born again. But every conscious contribution we make will only further disqualify us. There are no percentages in true regeneration. Either God provides 100% or the work remains undone. Every percent that I apply consciously will undermine the fact that this is God's 
unique gift. If I try to add faith, it will undermine God's free gift. If I try to add repentance, it will undermine God's gift. Oh, I hear the cry. That's so frustrating. Yes, it is. And I have a sneaking feeling that it's designed to be. By the way, that you know that the Hebrew language had no specific word for frustration until the middle of the 20th century. That doesn't mean that people didn't have the experience, only that they were forced to describe it differently. I wonder what you word you would use if you were told you couldn't use that word. Would you call it anger or disappointment? What is frustration? Frustration is really the way I feel when my will is being thwarted or frustrated. I want to be in control of this situation, but I'm not, and I can't bring my choices to bear. In short, and at its most brutal, it's the way I feel when I'm not getting my own way. Theologically, it's God not allowing me to be God, and my reaction to that realisation. Every human effort to produce regeneration will result in frustration. God has determined that the choicest gift of regeneration will be the consequence of his grace. And because of that, it can only be received by faith. I love this sentence in Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Therefore, it is a faith. He's talking about salvation. Salvation is a faith that it might be according to grace. In other words, grace comes first. Then there is my response, which is faith. And we are saved by grace through faith. We're not saved by grace. We're saved by grace through faith. We're not saved by faith. We're saved by faith through grace. But it is a faith that it might be according to grace. God has determined that this salvation will be unachievable to human beings, but that it is receivable as a free gift. God, Him say, me, okay, I'm going to describe that or expound that statement in a bit. The Judaism of Christ and Paul's day had reduced the law to a kind of a ladder of achievement in which they thought that God received them because they'd attained a particular standard or had maintained a particular standard. Against this notion, Paul makes his most extreme objections. God, he writes in Romans 4 verse 5, justifies the ungodly. What an outrageous statement. God justifies the ungodly. If our theology does not include this statement, it is incomplete. In fact, it is seriously defective. This is all about how do we gain acceptance with God? Well, we are accepted with God and declared to be right with him, not on the basis of our own righteousness, our own achieved righteousness, but because of what Christ has achieved at Calvary and our simple but absolute trust in him. Being justified, declared right with God, is never on the basis of us keeping law, but on the basis of our reliance upon someone else. As Amy Carmichael, the Indian missionary, as fond of quoting, upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, upon another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. That is Bible faith. All my eggs are in one basket. Upon a life I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. Upon another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. Let's see if we can distinguish between justification and regeneration. Justification is a change in our legal standing before God. Regeneration is a change in our nature, worked by God. Now, often the words justification or conversion or regeneration are used in ordinary Christian conversations as if they were synonyms. 
but they're not. These are very distinct ways of describing different ways of looking at salvation. Different aspects, you might almost say. They may at times synchronize, but that doesn't make them synonyms. They are, there are very few absolute synonyms in the Bible, I think. At times, justification and regeneration might synchronize. At times, they don't synchronize. This is where the puzzle begins. David Pawson, the late David Pawson, wrote a book called The Normal Christian Birth, and uh, there are many parts of it that I um, agree with, I like very, very strongly. Not every word he says, but um, he pointed out the confusion caused by failing to distinguish between conversion and regeneration. It's a simple fact of Bible Greek that God is never the subject of the verb convert as it applies to human beings. In other words, it never speaks of God converting people. People convert people. And sometimes people convert themselves. But biblically, God never converts anyone. Now, I know that there are lots of stories about people who were converted by other people. I remember hearing a story told by an evangelist himself um, on one occasion of uh, he was traveling on a plane and there was someone who came by the side and sat by the side of him who was drunk. Um, and he began to talk and he discovered that this man was a well-known evangelist. And the man said, this is wonderful. He said, I've always wanted to meet you. He said, I'm one of your converts. And the evangelist said, I think you probably are one of my converts. You're clearly not one of God's. But that's a misuse, really, of the word convert in the way that the Bible uses it. From a biblical perspective, God never converted anyone. Let me illustrate it for you. This is Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Peter speaks to the crowd and he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, this translation makes it sound as though the word repent is an order, an imperative. Do this. And so it is. However, the words be converted sound as though that word is passive. In fact, both words are active imperatives. In other words, you repent and you convert. God justifies and God regenerates. Man has no part in these miracles, though faith is man's responsibility. Conversion is man's work. It signifies the turning from one way to another, and it is a human being that has to do that. Justification, on the other hand, is God's work. There's a, there's a wonderful, delightful, pigeon English definition of justification. I heard this first from um, missionaries from the uh, uh, Wycliffe Bible translators. They were talking about the difficulties they have sometimes in translating from one language to another. And they were trying to express some ideas and give some uh, biblical truth to people who didn't really have English as their own language at all and whose own mother tongue was very basic. These were very simple uh, folks um, in that aspect. And they wanted to explain what justification meant. And they prayed, and no doubt they struggled, and they prayed some more, and they came across a phrase. In this particular country, it was Papua New Guinea, they used a kind of a lingua franca, a trade language, called Pidgin English. It has English words, but it's not used in an English way, and sometimes the words don't mean what an Englishman thinks they mean. So they search for a pidgin English phrase which would explain what the Bible doctrine of justification means. And they came up with a crude but wonderfully precise phrase. They said, God, him say, me okay. <laughs> How many words is that? Five. God, 
him say, me, okay, a whole book's a bit written on justification. And yet this is so precise and theologically it would be difficult to improve on that definition. Justification is not the way I feel or the way that someone else may feel about me. Justification is the pronouncement, it is the judge who, make, who having heard the charge against me and having heard the evidence, decides that I am guilty of the, uh, the crime of which I've been accused. If its sentence is death, then he is led from the court and put to death. But if his sentence is that he is just, that is to say, the case against him has not been proven, he is declared to be just with reference to the accusation that was made against him, and he walks from the court a free man, not because he feels innocent, but because the court has declared him to be just. Justification comes from one of the backgrounds of the Bible. There are lots of backgrounds in the Bible which give us a rich treasury of words. And justification comes from that part of this rich treasury which is called the, the forensic or the legal background. It's not a pronouncement that just anyone can make. It's the legal verdict of a judge. So it, it doesn't, in this sense, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what your enemies think, what matters is what the judge says. What does the judge say? Only the judge can declare someone to be just of the accusations against, uh, which have been brought against him. Grace is the source here, and justification is always by grace, but always through faith. Grace is the source, and faith is the channel. Faith does not create any virtue or deserving on my part, but simply facilitates God's free grace. It is the channel through which the grace of God flows. In other words, the initiative always begins with God and always concludes with God. I cannot believe at my own whim, but only because I've heard the voice of God. But once I have heard that voice, I will be held responsible for my response. This is one of the sources, this justification that God has used to communicate truth to us. It's the language that Isaac Watts called God's condescending ways. That's the old English use of the word meaning to come down to our level. If the word and concept of justification comes from the background of the law court, then the word regeneration comes from the vocabulary of life itself. It's not forensic, but dynamic. So justification is forensic. Regeneration is dynamic. Justification has to do with records and standing and declarations by the judge. Regeneration has to do with life being imparted and its development. Let's take a couple of Old Testament witnesses. Paul has a lot to say about justification by faith in Romans, and he's introduced the, just introduced the topic, and he's spoken of Abraham. And then he makes a statement about Abraham, and he says, um, what shall we say that Abraham, our father according to the flesh, has found? In other words, he's, he's asking, what is, what's Abraham's experience? He said, he's made some statements, and he's now going to look at Abraham's experience. Before he even gets to Abraham, he speaks about David. And he says, David described something. This is Romans chapter 4, verse 6. They, as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God reckons righteousness separate apart from works. That little phrase, the blessedness of the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works, that is justification by faith. When God puts righteousness to our account, not because we've achieved it, but because we've put all our eggs in one basket and trusted him and the work that Christ achieved at Calvary. 
So, blessed are those, he goes on, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, the first part of this, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered, is not coming from the legal background. If you think about it, a judge is never going to talk about forgiveness of sins. And neither is he ever going to talk about sins being covered. His job is to identify where the sin or crime has taken place and if the man is guilty, to pronounce the sentence against him. So the first half of this, David describing the blessedness of the man to whom God records righteousness apart from words, um, are not from the forensic or legal background. They are from the sacrificial background of the services in the tabernacle and in the temple. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are literally, it is, remitted, sent away. There was, as I'm sure you know, a very important day in the year of the people of Israel. It was called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And uh, on that day, um, God had given them a special ceremony, we might call it, a special way of making a sacrifice which would begin to help them to understand some of the truths that would be developed later. That's a bit complex, isn't it? But the picture was this, that the priest acting on behalf of the whole nation of Israel would lay his hands heavily. He would lean on a goat. There were two goats. And he would lean his hands on one goat. Well, sorry, the first goat had been would be sacrificed as a sin offering. But then he would lay his hands heavily on the other goat and he would rehearse, he would pronounce all the sins of Israel. I don't know how long this talk took or whether they, he, he just worked in certain areas of sins. But once he'd done that, the second goat was not sacrificed. The second goat was driven away. It was remitted, sent away into the wilderness in the picture language carrying away from God's presence the sins of all the people. This is not forensic. You, they don't do this in law courts. This is this is temple. And whose sins are covered. Now, covered, this has got the idea of atonement. The idea that something is hidden, carried away from God's sight, hidden from being an offense to God because blood has been shed. This is all what the Bible calls typical. That means that it's um, it's a type, it's a picture, it's a template. It's an example which would be enlarged later in the New Covenant. But when David has described a blessedness that he obviously has experienced in some way himself, otherwise he, he would ha not have much to say about it, uh, he says, blessed, oh, the blessednesses it is. Oh, the blessednesses of the men to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are remitted, sent away. And any Jew would immediately have in their mind a picture of a goat galloping away into the wilderness, carrying the sins of Israel away from the presence of God. And whose sins are covered, and any Jew who was listening to this but have a mental picture of the Ark of Atonement and, and, the, and the covering of the propitiatory that was put on the top of it. But then, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now we're back to the forensic idea. So, Apparently, blessedness, if we divide these up, sorry if this is a bit long-winded and complicated, David describes the blessednesses of someone who is justified by faith. And he itemizes them, or at least Paul itemizes them for him. It includes imputed righteousness, God's own righteousness put to our account. It includes the remitting or sending away of trespasses. 
It includes the atonement whereby the offence is hidden in the picture language from the gaze of God. And fourthly, it is a refusal to keep a record of sin. So that's um, no wonder he says, oh, the blessedness is. But he goes back behind David to Abraham. He's going to answer his own question now. What shall we say that Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, is found? And he's got a story in mind. And it's a wonderfully rich expression of what was no doubt David's own experience and blessing and the list that comprises the blessings that, that are the consequences of justification. It appears in a chapter in Romans that Paul begins by asking that question, what was Abraham's experience? And the list is the answer. The chapter concludes with the statement that the record of Abraham's and David's experience was not mere archive. It wasn't just a fact written down. It was written not for his sake alone, that it was important to him. And I think we can include both uh, Abraham and David. Abraham, Abram, as he was at this point, was justified by faith before he was in covenant with God, before he was circumcised. When he was, you might almost say technically, a non-Jew, he had not been circumcised. But God declared him to be right with him. It worked like this. Abraham, Abraham, I'll try and be consistent. Abraham uh, was invited to go out into the dark night and to look up the stars. And God promised him that he would have as many progeny, there would be as many seed that would come from Abraham as the stars in the sky. If God could count, if he could count them, that's how many there would be. And the Bible then, in Genesis 15, verse 6, has a simple little sentence which becomes one of the foundation stones for the whole of the New Testament and the Old Testament as well for that part. Uh, he, it says this. It says, Abraham believed God. Now, of course, he couldn't have believed God if God had not initiated this process. So follow the links in the chain here. God has spoken and Abraham believed God. That's the second link. And the third link, it says, and the Lord reckoned it to him for righteousness. So we've got three links of a chain. The first link and the third link are God's part. The speaking of the word, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So God makes the word known to us in our hearts. And then that is required a response from us. That's our link of the chain. That's Abraham. God gave the word. Abraham believed it. Abraham could not give the word. And God would not believe it. This is, this is job identification. God gives the word. Abraham believes it. God endorses it in doing the thing that had been promised. He credits to Abraham's account righteousness, not because of Abraham's achievements, but because of Abraham's faith in God. It's an amazing thing. And he was before the covenant. David was in the middle of the Sinai covenant. But I'm keeping it simple or trying to. And then, of course, there is us in a new covenant. And in that new covenant, this pattern of justification by faith still holds true. Where there's no covenant, where there's old covenant, where there's new covenant, it makes no difference. This is self-standing justification by faith. Paul writes in Romans 4, verse 23, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. It's Abraham and David. But also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him 
who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offences and was raised up because of our justification. Because everything was done, Christ called out the victory, triumph, cry, it is finished. He was buried and then God raised him from the dead as his own Amen to the effectiveness of the work that Christ had had achieved upon the cross. This is an amazing thing. So God spoke, Abraham believed, and God credited Abraham's account with righteousness. Paul now says, everyone who believes in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, that's God's word has been spoken into his heart. If he believes, then that principle of imputation of righteousness applies to him. It's not just for the blessing of Abraham and David, but it's for the blessing of all who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now this is wonderful. But there's more, much more. And that's usually my introduction to the Romans chapter 5. Much more. Romans chapter 4 is the foundation for Romans chapter 5. It begins with the common experience of all those who are justified by faith, but it builds on that a brand new building. The theme of justification, now firmly established, settles somewhat into the background. And Paul moves on to the issues of life and power. He's moving now, in one sense, away from or developing the theme from the forensic of justification by faith and is moving into issues of the dynamic, life and power. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's laying the foundation, is reminding us, okay, we've already established the justification by faith. And because of that, because God has taken away our sin, we have peace with God. There's no longer any animosity between us through Jesus Christ. And then Paul writes this, through whom also, ah, we keep that word in mind, through whom also, also in addition to having been justified by faith, and in addition to having peace with God, We also have, topic number three in Paul's little sentence here, access, it means an introduction to, access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So the first two are established. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. The third one says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. So remember our three links to the chain. Grace is the first link. God speaks. God speaks. The second link is faith. Someone has to believe with all their heart that it's true what God has said. And thirdly, God then reckons that person to be right with him and declares it to be so. We have access by faith into this grace, but I think this grace speaks of something else. Paul is moving on. This speaks of the greater grace that Paul is going to speak of in Romans chapter 5. This justifying faith gives us access into this grace in which we stand. But the grace in which we stand is the much more grace of regeneration. And Paul goes on. This part of it also. Also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So Paul has access into 
greater grace, and he is rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Paul's reference here to the glory of God is all the more amazing if we remind ourselves about an earlier reference. When Paul was establishing the guilt of the whole of humanity, he pointed out that there was no difference in the culpability, the blameworthiness of Jew or Gentile. Romans 3 verse 22, he says, There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is forensic law court language. They've fallen short of the keeping of a law. But he now says he's standing in this grace. Paul is rejoicing in a restored hope of the glory of God. That which was forfeited by the first man is now potentially restored through another man. And the hope that Paul has is not wishful thinking, because the work has already begun. He goes on to say, Now hope does not disappoint. It's a word that has a kind of a feeling of um, being of blushing because of shame. Mark Twain, the American humorist, once said that man is the only animal that blushes and the only one that has cause to. He had some wise comments at times in his um, strange logic. So, Paul, this hope, he isn't embarrassed by this hope. Um, he isn't disappointed by this hope. He isn't going to blush because of this hope. Why? Well, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Literally, or perhaps paraphrased, there's no reason to blush. There's no reason to be embarrassed with this hope. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. And of course, for Paul, that is the pattern of those who are in Christ. We've come in Paul's declaration to a kind of a historical reality, to the era of the poured out spirit. And we're on familiar ground here. This is the language of the Pentecostal effusions and of untraceable, untrackable winds. In Romans chapter 5, we have moved, Paul is moving, into the consequences of the realized new covenant. And it is based upon the foundation of justification by faith. That's always, the, that's always in place. So let's think about the achievements of the cross. Paul now recounts the reversal of Adam's sin. Adam, as the federal head of the race, sinned, and that sin impacted all his race, all who are in Adam, and the whole race is in Adam by natural birth. But in Paul's exposition, now a second man enters the scene. <clears throat> and there's no doubt that the second man is Christ. The second man enters the scene and achieves something by his death that impacts the entire race. And Adam, I, I think this is a, a really striking comment. He says that Adam is a type of Christ. Now, we've got lots of types of Christ in the Old Testament. But I, I would certainly never have thought of Adam as a type of Christ unless God had revealed it. We've moved from law courts into the dynamic, into life and families. In Christ, the old man was decisively co-crucified with Christ. Our death he died, bringing to an end, bringing to an end for those in Christ that whole Adamic racial solidarity. In Christ, we are finished with the old man and we put off his old ways. This is where our favourite verse surfaces again. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Nothing avails other than a new creation. This cannot be achieved by any bolt on bits and pieces. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So how then do we get to be in Christ? If we are assured of his acceptance and know that God him say me okay, how do we move from justification to regeneration? If you are thirsty, Jesus said on one occasion, come to me and drink. There is no technique available here, but only personal engagement with Christ himself. John chapter 7, verse 37, begins like this. At the last day, on the last day, on the last day of that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then John, the writer, adds his comment. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. That is John staking, uh, stating very, very plainly that this promise, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink, is like a post-dated check. It's good and you can hold on to it, but it's not live, it's not available to you until you get to the day. You'll have to count down the days. Uh, but when the day of Pentecost is fully come, this is what they did. They counted down the days in prayer. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a sound from heaven. A birth was coming from heaven. A new creation was coming from heaven. On the last day of that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spake concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Spirit is now given. The promise is now live. The day has come. So what do we mean by receiving the Spirit? There are often consequences to receiving the Spirit, and some of which may be seen or heard. But we must not confuse the consequences which surround the event of receiving the Spirit with receiving the Spirit himself. What am I talking about? Well, some, and I was one of these for a long time, specialized in these consequences and described them as proofs, as initial evidence that the Spirit had come. I no longer hold that view. But this is a damaging confusion which leaves some people believing that they have received the Spirit simply because there have been certain physical phenomena. Here is a little phrase for you. This comes from the world of the statisticians. Correlation does not necessarily imply causation. I'll say it again. Correlation does not necessarily imply causation. The fact that things happen together does not mean that one is the cause of another. There's an ancient description of receiving the Spirit that provides a valuable caution. It's in that famous chapter of Ezekiel where he describes the valley of the dry bones and he's, he's told to prophesy uh, to the wind. Ezekiel 37 and verse 30 and verse 7 uh, it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. The bones came together, bone to bone. 
Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. And this is Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. This looks like a massacred army. This is all the dead. The dead of Israel. Dead in sins and trespasses. All of us dead. And the Spirit speaks to Ezekiel and says, Can these bones live? And Ezekiel is somewhat cautious and he says, You know, Lord. And God says, Prophesy to these bones. Prophesy to them. And he prophesies, and this is it. I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Remember the word translated breath. Here is the Hebrew word, which also translates as spirit. So let me put spirit in them. Let me put that word in. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And yet as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. There was no spirit in them. This is a sobering and salutary description. There's clear response to Ezekiel's prophetic ministry. Things are happening, dramatic things, noisy things, rattling, shakings. For many in our current era, this would be sufficient proof that the Spirit had arrived. But Ezekiel has more discernment. He observes that there was no spirit in them. This may well be works of preparation. But correlation does not necessarily imply causation. And then he's addressed as the Son of Man. And he frequently is addressed as the Son of Man. And of course it was Jesus' favourite description of himself, I think. Ezekiel is not just a prophet. It seems that at times he is himself a prophecy. He, as the Son of Man, performs an action in his prophetic ministry that actually is an amazing picture of what was to happen. So, Son of Man, Ezekiel is called, is called through at the passage, the passage, then speaks to the Spirit. Ezekiel 37, verses 9 and 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and Spirit came into them. And they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. He distinguished between all the activity, all the bustle, all the things that were being done, and the time when the Spirit entered into them and they lived. It's an amazing parallel with the Son of Man. Jesus brought the word of God, and still does. There was, and often is, much activity. Dramatic things occurred, and they still do. Bones were gathered together. A body was being assembled. Sinew is in flesh. But the body was still effectively a corpse until Christ ascended to the throne and from the throne spoke to the Spirit and sent him. And the Spirit entered into them and they lived. It is Christ's unique prerogative to give the Spirit. And if we are thirsty, we must come to Him and drink. It may be help to have others who can stand with you in faith if you seek God like this. But don't rely upon their faith. All you have to do is just simply come to Christ and drink. Do you wonder why we don't see the power of the New Covenant more obviously in our day? Well, in my view, I think there are probably two reasons at least. One is, I think, that goes along with that verse from the prophets that says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. I think people are unaware 
of the implications. Jesus said that, you know, to a Samaritan woman. She wanted a drink and he said, if you knew who it was that asked you and the gift of God, you would ask and you would have received. If you knew. Do think about these things, brothers and sisters, and let God instruct you about what he has available for you. And also, I think that sometimes people do not live in the full power of the new covenant because they have not yet joined the new covenant. They have not yet been united with Christ in that baptism of spirit, which makes them one with him so that things are true in him and in us. Let me finish by talking about revelation and realization. Paul has two places in his letter to the Ephesians where he speaks about his prayer. And the first prayer is about revelation. And the second is about realization. This is Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. He's just said that he's heard of their faith. And in verse 17, he says, he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you. Notice this phrase. These aren't just words added in to fill up <laughs> the lines. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, that you may fully know. By revelation, he means an inner insight into truth. In the epistle to the Colossians, his prayer is for spiritual understanding. He's praying that men and women will see what God has in his mind, in his plan, in his heart for them. And he subdivides this first Ephesian prayer into three sections and asks that they may know, first of all, the hope of his calling, Christ's calling. Secondly, the riches of Christ's inheritance, his inheritance in the saints. And thirdly, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. It's quite a list. And as I say, the Lord, the word know here implies to see with the eyes or to perceive. Perhaps they were already seeing it in a measure, but he's praying for the process to continue. So let's work our way through these. He's praying that the eyes of their understanding would be opened, that they would know fully what is the hope of his calling. Now, what is the hope of his calling? That you go to heaven when you die? Oh, more, much more. Your calling is to be an image bearer of Christ himself, transfigured from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The hope is that the mystery secret would be expressed in the lives of God's people, that Christ would be in them the hope of glory, as Paul describes it to the church at Colossae. That was Adam's original calling, to be in the likeness and image of God, to reveal the nature of God in flesh and blood to the rest of the creation. God has never given up on this project, if we may call it that. This is why we were created, and in spite of the fall, God has provided a remedy that deals not only with our past sins, but with the consequence of Adam's sin as they continue effect to affect our lives. Secondly, he's praying that they would have full knowledge of the riches of the glory of his, that's Christ's inheritance, in the saints. The language of inheritance always echoes the land promised to a covenant community. But Christ's 
saints are his inheritance. The saints are Christ's inheritance. In answer to the prayer that we read of in Psalm 2, the Son speaking to the Father, Ask of me, and I will give the nations for your inheritance. The new covenant community, the community of the church, is his. It's Christ. You're blessed, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father, and I say to you, the Jew of Petras, this is the rock and I will build you upon this rock. And then he says, my church, I will build my church. This isn't the Ecclesia of Jehovah that we read of in the Septuagint of the Old Testament. This isn't the assembly of God that came into being at Sinai. This is Christ looking forward, future tense, on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Certainly we have an inheritance of our own to look forward to. But this is not that. This is Christ's inheritance. It is Christ's inheritance in the saints. He wants them to see that the purpose of their calling is to be Christ's own people. It is the new covenant fulfillment of an ancient promise. At Sinai, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, God speaks through Moses to the people. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is when Israel became a nation. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me. Above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I will be their God, and they will be my people. It's an amazing promise. An amazing promise. You are his. You are his. And he is yours. And he delights in you. He delights in his church. He loves the church. I'm not talking now about the church as men see it. I'm not talking about what they call the uh, church on earth or the, uh, what do they call it, the church militant. Um, I don't see those divisions in the scripture. We'll come to it when we get to the second prayer. This is a prayer for his people. Then what about the third point on the list? He prays that they will know the power that works in us, his power that works in us. He prays that they may see the nature of the power that is at work in them. He says that it's nothing less than the power that was at work when Christ was raised from the dead and seated at God's right hand. What a journey that was from the tomb to the throne. It's that same power that as it works in God's people. How how would do we react to these amazing things that he wants us to see? That the first one, the hope of his calling that we should be image bearers of the Christ, his image moving from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. How can we live worthy of the calling with which we are called? I have a a silly old joke that I sometimes tell, depending on the occasion, of a farmer 
who rolled an ostrich egg into the chicken coop and said, that's to just to encourage you. You can imagine the effect of encouragement it had on the chickens. And sometimes we see these glorious statements of God's plans for us. And maybe our reaction is a big sigh. How can these things ever be? Maybe Mary sighed when she said, how can these things be? And the answer is the same. The Spirit. The nature of the power that works within them. He prays that they may see the nature of the power that is at work in them. He says it's nothing less than the power that was at work when Christ was raised from the dead and seated at God's right hand. It's the same power that's at work in God's people, not just to save them from hell, but to give them a share in his death, his resurrection, his glory, to seat us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If the power of God could raise Christ from the tomb to a throne, what can it do in me? Is the covenant, is the new covenant just too good to be true? Or can God deliver what he has promised? Well, this is where we go from the revelation, the need for revelation, to the promise of its realization. This is Paul's second prayer. It's the realization in the saints. It's vital that we see what God has done and is doing, but the truth must become my truth. It must become truth in me. This is Ephesians 3, beginning to read at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father. we back to this Father, and we've got the images now of the family, dynamics of life and relationship. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the work, power that works in us. What a prayer this is. Christ made real in the heart. His, promise, his prayer focuses again on the work of the Spirit. It's through the power of the received Christ that Christ is made real in the heart. When he walked on the earth and even when he was raised from the dead, he was with them by his Spirit. But his great promise had been that the one who had been with them would soon be within them. The indwelling Christ is the consequence of the indwelling Spirit. This, as we've seen in our journey, was one of the key elements in the New Covenant. A new heart, a new Spirit, God's own Spirit indwelling, and the law written on the heart. Dunamis. Not bolt on power, not external power, but inherent power. Power that springs from the nature of a thing. Essential, inward, inherent power. It's often translated ability and appears twice in this second prayer list. He prays that they may be strengthened with ability, power, through the Spirit in the inner man. He, he knows that only by the enabling power of the indwelling spirit can Christ inhabit the heart in reality. God, you see, is the able God. This is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. He who is able, that's the word dunamis, he who is empowered, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, 
according to the power, that dunamis, that works in us. It is because God has the ability, dunamis, to do, that we can have the ability to be. The transformed life of the new covenant is not the result of greater effort, but of greater grace. Paul speaking by the Spirit, power superlative on top of superlative. He's not only able to do above all that we ask or think, he is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. Not only exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Language can take us no further. This is all the fullness of God. God's power made available to fulfill all the promises of a new covenant. To accomplish it according to the ability of the power that is working in us. What is it Peter says? He says that God has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. The enabling is because of the indwelling. There's glory to be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. That's the purpose of all this. In verse 21 he goes on, he says, that there might be glory in the church, in the heavenly realm where angels good and bad see it, on the earth where our neighbors see it, that that might be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, this is just the beginning. We've examined things which are breathtaking, but it is only the beginning. This new covenant has made it possible for God's ancient longings and will to be fulfilled. Let's let Paul have the last word as he speaks about himself. Ephesians 3 and verse 21. To me, having just said that there might be glory in the church, he goes on to say, To me who am less than the least of saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known, made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenless, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Boldness, access, let's put it in the other order, shall we? Faith, access, boldness. We can take him at his word. Well, in this final chapter, we discover that there's no formula that guarantees success, but that the persistent appeal of the Bible is that we come to Christ when we're thirsty. We see that this speaks not of an evangelical formula, but of personal encounter with a personal saviour. No one can prescribe an infallible route. But these promises stand, that those who seek shall find, and those who come will never be turned away. It is God's ability to do that gives you and me the ability to be. So thank you for your company and fellowship on this journey of the Better Covenant Revisited. If you've reached this point, you've shown remarkable persistence and perseverance. Thank you. If you'd like to send us some comments, it will be a help for any future projects that are already beginning to kind of turn in our minds. Thank you all. And it would remain now for me to give my thanks to my companions in labor. There's a Greek word, sunogoi, which means co-workers. And in this project, I've had two in particular. 
Mike Coles from New Life Radio, who invited me to do a regular series for weekly publishing on his own website, his own radio website, and has nursed me through the whole project and provided very necessary technical support from time to time. And Robert, Robert Woods, who was the co-host and webmaster of BibleBase.com, without whom BibleBase would be really possibly a distant memory. I can't begin to thank you two brothers adequately for all your willing labours in this project. To remind all of us to just be thankful for without these faithful brothers and your prayer, I think this little boat would have founded long ago. (laughs) I can't say until next time this week, but I can say thank you for listening. God bless you.